This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy with my co-host and the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. That's Sharon Mori Aloha. Walker. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Jay. And our special guest who is, is here from the mainland, from Portland, um, and he came here to participate in the conference yesterday, a Hawaii Clean Energy, uh, energy Day. What, what, what? Pathways to tr Clean Transportation. Clean Transportation Day. And he talked about integrating energy and transportation. Very important. Okay, we're going to get to that in some detail. Craig Dirksen, thank you for coming down, Craig. My pleasure, Jay. Thanks for having me on the show. Craig is a counselor in the Oregon Metro Organization, and that means the guys who planned the Metro Organization in Portland, which is a really win-win kind of arrangement. Terrific um, thing called Max, and it gets you all around town economically. Yeah, well, why don't you tell us about yourself? Include the part where you were mayor of Tigard. Okay. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, the Portland metropolitan area, which is uh, actually 24 cities, including the city of Portland, but 23 others as well. I actually live in the city of Tigard, lived there since 1977. And I was the mayor there for nine years, but I was term limited and couldn't be mayor any longer, so I decided to run for the Metro uh, Council. The Metro Council is the regional government that has responsibility for land use and transportation mm, planning, mm. as well as some other things like running the zoo and the convention center. And stuff oh, like that. so this is much broader than just uh, just uh, the 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 train, the transit oh, in, in Portland. Absolutely. In fact, we don't actually do transit. TriMet is the organization in the in the Portland metro area that does transit, but but we are responsible for uh, funneling uh, federal funding because mm -hmm. we're the Metropolitan Planning Organization mm -hmm. for the Portland metro mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. So we work in very close partnership with TriMet and the Oregon Department of Transportation and the Portland uh, uh, Transportation Bureau to fund transportation projects all across the region. This is like our Oahu Metropolitan uh, OMPO, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. planning organization. It's, but they're broad, it's much broader than what OMPO yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. Because we are, uh, we are the only MPO in the United States where the members of the board are actually directly elected by the people mm. instead of being appointed to that position is by it someone that way? else. I think it is, and it also gives us because accountability it, we're accountable directly to the people and being an elected body, it allows us to have our own uh, taxing district so we can raise money to do things uh, ah, also. That's important. So we have Generally, some authority there. Most MPOs, all they are is funnels for, yeah. fun, for funding coming through from the federal government. Yeah, yeah. So you've been there for a long time. Well, I've, I've been in elected office now since 2000. Okay. Gee, that goes back. I've been uh, uh, on the Metro <laughs> Council for five years. I'm just in my first year of my second term on Metro Council. Okay, so you can come and speak to us about transit in Portland. I can. Yeah, that's the important yeah. thing. And he did. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. So now, Sharon, why don't you, you, you know, from your side of it, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, why did you bring Craig in? We looked around for somebody like Craig, you know, because we're, it's not just about transit, it's about transportation and energy. And we're coming from the energy perspective. And, and transportation has always had its own problems and challenges. So it's, it's been focused on roads and, and not really, and the planning is where the roads go and not something bigger and, and seeing the big picture. And so we saw that Portland was doing it, Vancouver was doing it, and Portland um, had that energy sustainability focus to what it was doing, and it was broader in scope than just transit, just a rail. Uh, and so um, we looked around, and we were in touch with the Smart Transportation Institute people, and, and we said, you know, who can we bring? And, and they said, we know the person. <laughs> All fingers pointed to Craig. And pointed to Craig, and we were so pleased that he was available. They're on break now for Metro Council. So it just worked out perfectly, and we're pleased that he was able to come join us. And he's been open to meeting with everybody. We just came from uh, meeting with uh, some of the representatives uh, uh, at the Capitol mm -hmm. on, on talking about the issues that we had and how uh, Craig's experience has been able, and he was able to answer questions on autonomous cars even, <laughs> <laughs> beyond rail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very valuable to have somebody, you know, we can do idea arbitrage between mm -hmm. Portland, which is a special place, a su successful place in transit, um, to Hawaii. 
So can you you were there yesterday? You spent mm -hmm. the whole day. I saw you. I know. Uh -huh. I, I got witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> how, how was it for you? What did you think of that conference? Well, I loved being there and being part of it and being able to share what we're doing in Portland. But it was great hearing what's going on here in Hawaii, too. And then going beyond that, questions like, where do we go from here? What's the future mean? When we're looking at uh, alternative fuels so that we can reduce our dependence on, on uh, oil, on imported oil. And is that the, is that the right thing uh, to, to be focusing on? I really like that you dug right down into the weeds and say, what, what our, our what are our goals? Let's articulate what the goals are. Once we can agree on that, then we can start talking about what actions we can take to achieve the goals. Mm -hmm. So not taking anything for granted, looking at all different options, and really figuring out what everybody really means when they talk about what do we do next. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go back and talk about Oregon for a little while, okay. about Portland. Um, your experience, I mean, not only your experience, but before your experience, sure. how has uh, you know, transit in Portland evolved and where is it now? Take a few minutes to tell us. Well, I think I can give a good perspective because Metro's not responsible for transit or just for transit, but we're responsible for all the transportation planning for the Port mm. Portland metro it's area. It's all connected, isn't it? Exactly. Mm. The, uh, my, uh, my mantra has always been that what a region needs, what a metropolitan area needs, is a complete transportation system that includes all the different modes, whether it's roads, transit, uh, bikes, ped, and you need all those things in the right proportion to each other so that everybody has different options and each person's needs can be met for what they need today. And it is achievable. You absolutely. We, it we absolutely have the is. tools and the, you know, the software, whatever we need to achieve exactly what you were talking about. Yeah. I and agree. you did that in Portland. Well, I wouldn't say we've done it, but we are doing it. It's not something that you do and are complete. It's, it's a process that you're continually going through. You mean it changes? Absolutely. So if I look at Portland today, even with the success you've had, and I look at Portland in five years from now, it'll be different. Portland is growing so fast. We're growing about 1.5% a year, and that comes down to, because of the size of our area, we're seeing about 111 people a day moving to Portland, which means 33 families and maybe 50 cars. That more that we need to deal with every day, mm -hmm. and so Real figuring how prices to, probably going up. It's uh, uh, <laughs> Portland isn't the most expensive place to live on the West Coast, but our prices, our real estate prices, are going up faster than anybody else's mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the West Coast. If we're gonna go. We should go now. It, yeah, <laughs> you know, I've I've lived in the house I live in now uh, since 1987, and uh, today I could not afford to buy the house that I live in. That's so that's in Hawaii, pretty, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought that might that's a, similar, that's a similar problem, yeah. <laughs> so tell us the good things that have been established and achieved with Portland uh, Metro. Well, one of the things that, that we've been able to do, the Portland Metro has certain responsibilities, and there are other areas that aren't our responsibility, but because of our position as the entire region, we can act as the convener to bring together all those people. We've got 24 cities in three counties. All those cities have their own mayor and city council. Each county has its uh, county commissioner uh, board. But we are the place where all those folks can come down and sit at one table mm. and hash out these issues, whether it's transportation or housing or homelessness or equity or water or emergency preparedness. We're the place where everybody comes to talk together. Okay, big question now, Craig. Is that table, the discussion at that table, is it rational? <laughs> Think hard now. <laughs> we need to hear from you about this. <laughs> um, it, it can be contentious. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Um, Portland has this reputation, this certain reputation, but it's not like we're all a bunch, we're a monolith, all walking in, lock, in lockstep. We've got a large urban center. We've got big suburbs around ex-urban areas where people, it's still rural. So a lot of different people with a lot of different opinions on how things ought to be and how things ought to be done. And so, no, do we agree all the time? Oh, man, that is not the case. <laughs> But we have a place where we can all sit down and hash it out, and I think that's what makes the difference. Yeah. Well, what's the magic? What's, the, as they say, what's the special sesame sauce? In, involve people early and often through the process so that when you do come to a conclusion, the advocates and opponents from different areas all feel like they've had a hand in the decision and some ownership of it. 
Mm-hmm. Mm, that's yeah. good. Good advice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but this reminds me of the, you know the way David Bissell talks about Kauai, because mm. Kauai is a smaller island, smaller population, and yet and, and a lot of different opinions there, and yet they have achieved. Uh, um, a kind of rational discussion, a discussion which actually He's is talking about the, the utility, ahead. which is bolded in. It's a co-op. Yeah. So the same mm -hmm. kind of idea where you have lots of people, lots of opinions. Yeah. But, they have, but they allow those opinions and they, and they deal with those opinions. Well, but I, I have to really compliment Kauai and the people of Kauai because what we heard yesterday is the thing that makes the difference there is the folks are really engaged and they're willing to go and talk. And, and air how, how they feel and hear how other people feel as well. That's what makes the difference, mm -hmm. being able to have everybody come and be involved, be part of it. Okay, so now we have the, we have the special sauce, we have the rational conversation, <laughs> we have the five years you've been there, but actually longer. What has been the evolution of transit in Metro Portland? Well, of course, Portland had a bus system going way back. But we made the decision, uh, we were looking at, uh, in the 1970s, uh, a greatly expanded freeway network. And there was a lot of pushback against that. And so we made the decision to basically stop building more freeways and instead build a high capacity transit system. So we started building a light rail system in the early 1980s and we're still building it today. We opened our fifth light rail line last year. Light rail is at grade? Most of it's at grade. There, typically, it's at grade. It will it will rise onto structure to fly over other infrastructure where you don't want to have uh, yeah, sure. intersection or, interaction. Or traffic, yeah. But, but for the most part, it's at grade. And is that is it electrical? Yes, it's powered so by electricity. Overhead overhead, overhead, overhead wires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always wondered what happens if if the rail car moves away from the wires overhead. Well, the the track would have to move away. Oh, so. So, okay, this is all on a track. It's there's all no on wheels it's, involved. That's here. correct. Well, there's wheels, but there's steel <laughs> wheels. Sorry. No rubber tires Thank involved. Thank you for that. You heard that here on Think Tank. <laughs> wheels can be steel. <laughs> Does it make a lot of noise, the steel wheels? Because that's what people are complaining about. Yeah, oh, we've had lots of discussions rumble, about rumble. wheels. <laughs> there, there's a certain amount of noise. Um, I have to say that the on the train, uh, when, if you're comparing the the, the uh, level of service and the and the quality of service between buses and the train, the train is so quiet and it's smooth. It moves mm -hmm. very quickly through traffic. The beauty of the train, of course, is that it's not in traffic. So no matter mm -hmm. how congested it is, the, the, the time it takes to get from <laughs> point A to point B takes the same amount of time whether it's 8 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock in the that's morning. That's really important. <laughs> so traffic is not going to jam you up. That's right. Mm. Yeah. We're going to uh, take a short break, Sharon, if it's okay, okay with you. Sure. And, um, and Craig, when we come back from this break, we'd like to talk about the challenges you had because we have mm. our own challenges and maybe the way you dealt with those challenges can help us deal with our challenges. Challenge is Sharon's favorite word. I know. I love challenges. I like to hear how you overcome challenges. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Doug Rawson here, folks, your host on Where the Drone Leads, our weekly show at noon on Thursdays here on Think Tech, where we talk about drones, anything to do about drones, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned air crystals, whatever you want to call them, emerging into Hawaii's economy, educational framework, and our public life. We talk about things associated with the use, the misuse, uh, technology, engineering, legislation, with the local experts as well as people from across the country. Please join us noon on Thursdays and catch the latest on what's taking place in the world of drones that might affect you. Planning all week for the day of the big day. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a DD. Captain of our team, it's the For every game day, assign a designated driver. Okay, we're back. We're live uh, with uh, Craig Dirksen, and he's with the Oregon Metro Council. He's a counselor there. 
Uh, and we're talking about hmm, what happened, what they did in Portland, which is really a good study for us, a case study, if you will. So um, I just, I'm speaking for Sharon now when I, when I ask you. <laughs> My you favorite know, question. <laughs> there had to be some serious challenges because you're dealing with an interface of technology and government and the public and everybody's uh, expectations. What challenges? Well, we, we had, uh, let me give you the example of, that I experienced with the, the last light rail line when, when, that hasn't been built yet that was envisioned as part of the system when we first started talking about it in the early 80s. Uh, the only line that hasn't been built that was envisioned back then is the, the Southwest Corridor, which unfortunately it goes to where I live. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, it runs through the Southwest suburbs, uh, or will run through the Southwest suburbs of Portland, and then through Tigard where I live, and then on to an exurban area called Tualatin. Um, and uh, there's a lot of anti-rail sediment around the region. Uh, What's it based on? Concerns about, well, there's several things. It's too expensive. Uh, there are, are people who call it the crime train. They're concerned about so these. Worried about these, crime on the train. Crime yeah, people. From I, I, well, no, we I, did have an incident about a month ago, yeah. Yeah, but it, yes, yes, we did. But it, but it wasn't imported from somewhere else on the train. It was within the neighborhood where the people lived anyway. Mm, okay. uh, the studies have shown that crime doesn't travel. People commit crimes in their own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, I've given these people the example. I picture it, it's 2026 20, and the light rail line is in place. And it's 11 o'clock on a Friday night. And two guys get on the light rail train in Tigard headed for Portland. One of them's carrying a flat screen TV and the other one has a big bag of jewelry. <laughs> And they're sitting there on the train trying to look nonchalant. <laughs> it's just funny. My, my, my point being that a light rail train is a really lousy getaway vehicle. It really is. Because everybody knows where you're going to be for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Everybody's got a cell phone, too. Yeah. And of course, and we, but we've got people who say, we just want to drive everywhere. I don't want to ride transit. Quit spending money, quit wasting money on transit, and just widen all my roads. Why do I feel that? That is resonant to what we yeah. have here. So the, the, the sediment got so great that when we were going through the early planning process, there was a small group of citizens in Tigard who managed to actually get a measure on the ballot in Tigard mm. to change the city's charter to oppose light rail unless it was voted on by the people of the city. They felt like the sp citizens of Tigard should be able to decide whether the entire corridor got light rail or not. And it passed and became part oh of the goodness. charter of the city. It's not a way to build a railroad. No. Fortunately, in the response to that, uh, we worked on working with the people. We had dozens of public meetings where we shared what the plans were, showed what the different options were, showed what the different consequences would be and the cost would be for the different options to try to improve traffic through the region. Were you there, Craig? Were you I, speaking ab there? Absolutely. I was part of it from the beginning. Um, and when, uh, when we started the process of looking at this light rail line, uh, TriMet and Metro, which I was a, a member of at the time, I was the, uh, the mayor of Tigard, they came and said, okay, we're going to do this light rail line, and here's where we're going to draw the line. And I and the other mayors of the other cities that it was going to go through said, wait a minute, we all have comprehensive plans with development plans for this region. And we know where we want development to happen, and we know what kind of transportation is going to be needed to support it. So let's start with our comprehensive plans and then identify where we want the stations to be to serve the communities we want, and then you can figure out how to hook those together. Mm -hmm. So we actually uh, hijacked the system and made them do it backwards and do the, the land right use, way, though, the, do the that. land use planning yeah. first yeah. and then create the transportation plan to support the land that use. Sounds yeah. right to me. It's, right it's right. become the standard since then. Yeah, good um, experiment, good yeah. result. So uh, as the result of doing all the public outreach, lots of public meetings, allowing people to come in, look at the maps, look at the plans, we'd give them maps and, and, and colored markers and say, where do you think the line should go? Which neighborhood should it serve? Where should the, the stations be? How did you change the charter? You had to go back and change the charter to make this happen. Right? Well, what, they, what they, the, the charter amendment said that before you could have a vote of the people on the light rail line, we had to show them what it was going to be. So the charter amendment allowed us to go ahead with the planning to that point. And then two years later, the, the Tigard City Council put the measure on the ballot as required by the mm -hmm. charter change. 
do the citizens of Tigard support this so light you, rail plan? You never plan? had to change the charter. No, no, it operated within the charter. Well, the char correct. Mm -hmm. The charter change was to require the vote. And so we had the vote. Two years later, had the vote, and the people voted, yes, we support it, because oh. we know mm -hmm. what it's going to be. There's a lot of lessons in all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But it took a lot of information, providing people with the information that they needed so that they could make, at the ballot box, their informed decision. Yeah. So how is it now? How does it work? What are the, you know, the good points, and what are the bad points? Well, it's very expensive, as everybody knows. Expensive uh, to the rider or the city? To the city. Well, yeah, it's expensive to build. But the thing that you How need to... How much spend? Well, the, well the, we haven't built it yet. It's still just... Oh, it's over the, the southwest it, corridor. The southwest now. corridor is still in the planning process. Yeah. Uh, we anticipate that we'll probably start construction in about 2020, and we, it'll be open for operation probably in 2025. It's about a 15-mile long route not as long as yours but still longer <laughs> than the, not, not <laughs> but as but but longer than the average most light rail lines that are that are funded by the federal government are only about eight miles long mm -hmm. so both of us are are stretching to the limit mm -hmm. um, five billion no no uh, we're anticipating uh, somewhere between 2.6 and 3.2 for 15 miles yeah yeah well, why am I shaking? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're spending a lot more per mile than you. You're gonna well, spend you on that. know that stuff over the ocean. You've, you've <laughs> made the you've you've made the choice to elevate a large portion oh, of your line, yeah. which that's adds a lot to the expense. It's less impactful on the existing infrastructure, but the initial uh, construction costs are way higher. The good news about about light rail line, though, as opposed to just improving or incre increasing bus system, two things. First of all. You put more buses on the road, you're putting them on a road that's already really congested, it just adds to the congestion. And the buses can't move any faster than the congested traffic that it's in there with. Uh, you need to add capacity, not just switch capacity from roads. Can from, you get from, sufficient capacity with, uh, at grade? Oh, because sure. we've had people yeah. speak to both sides of that. Um, in other words, uh, right now this is a thing called Option 2A, mm -hmm. which uh, you must know about this. It stops at Middle Street, which is on the west side of the city, and then it goes under Option 2A. It goes down to grade, continues to grade into the downtown and, and mm -hmm. termination, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to overhead in mm -hmm. all segments of, of, the, of, the, of the project. Right. Uh, so uh, does at grade work? Do you think at grade would work here? Do you think Option 2A would work here? I don't, I don't have the, the facts about each of the two options specifically, but most of, almost all of our stuff is at grade. Does it give you sufficient capacity? You, you, the capacity isn't the issue. The concern is, is travel time. It's going to impact travel time because you're going to have to interact with the rest of traffic. You're going to have intersections with signals. But you can do things where you give the transit uh, signal priority before cars, those kinds of things, so to, to, to mitigate things. that. And I'm sure that you will do that as well. That's a standard way well, to deal with it. Well, that's what uh, your, your colleague, um, Eric uh, Sunquist, yesterday mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin, uh, was saying. You, you make an analysis uh, electronically, the GPS and all that, you, and you connect the dots, literally. All the dots are connected to find out what the travel time is. Uh, and you use a lot of computer database work to do that. Yeah. And then you can figure out how this organic thing, this organic community, neighborhood, what have you, city, uh, will work and how it will work differently with what kind of rail. That's a great way to model it. The cars and the signals and the trains, it becomes a big, huge ballet. Unfortunately, we've got computer programs ballet. that you are... You hear that? You heard it on TikTok. <laughs> ballet. <laughs> Beautiful thing. <laughs> uh, but we have computer programs that can, you know, can, that, that can choreograph it so, so everybody, it, so that it works. The other thing that's great about light rail as opposed to just improving bus service is the, is the operating costs, which is an ongoing cost that the state would, would, would burden every year. When you build a light rail line, it's very expensive up front to build but it's one-time money, and once it's done, you have it for a long, long time. And your uh, overall operating costs go way down because our estimation in Portland anyway is that your average light rail travel per, per passenger only costs about half to two-thirds as much as a bus trip costs. Interesting. You've got you, buses are much higher uh, maintenance. They don't last as long. Mm -hmm. we, we're still running the light rail cars that, that we started with 30, 30 years ago. Wow. Um, 
you only have one operator for every 288 passengers instead of an operator for every 40 passengers. You're going to go automated? Because our plan is to go automated. Here. You know, I think no be, operators. Be, because uh, because your line is almost all elevated, so you've got grade separation from the rest of traffic. I think that's a, a, a feasible option to consider. For us, it wouldn't be. You need a public. You need a, an adult. Yeah, lots or of adult. people. You need, and you need a human operator. On the street, even yeah. even with that, we still have problems with with cars stopping on the tracks. We have people with people on headphones and walking in front of the train. Accidents. So you need a human brain there to yeah. respond to that. Yeah. Sharon, you probably want to ask Craig about the energy effect of all of this. <laughs> I do, and Craig, <laughs> tell us, because he's told us already. <laughs> but, but he's looked at the whole, the whole picture, and, and that's what I want Craig to talk about, is energy in transportation, energy efficiency in transportation, and, and looking at it with the whole sustainability effort that, that you've done there in Portland, mm -hmm. which we, we haven't integrated that in, in, in a way of how do you look at that, how might you give us lessons learned of how you pull that together. Well, another way to measure energy efficiency is what kind of, of, uh, uh, of emissions do you get from your transportation as well. One of the things that have really driven this for us is that the Portland region has been required by the state government of Oregon to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 20% by 2035 per capita. Mm. And the, the it's a state rule. It's a state law, state requirement. And uh, uh, our study and analysis showed that the best way to achieve that would be to improve our transit so more people use transit instead of their cars. Uh, the transit is either with, with uh, uh, the light rail, it's, it's uh, electrical. Now, in Oregon, most of our electricity comes from very sustainable sources. We have hydropower. Mm -hmm. It's too bad, you guys, too bad you guys can't import the, the Columbia River. The Columbia got, River, we've right, got right a, we've, there. Yeah. We've got a river that runs right past Portland that's yeah. half the size of uh, the, the Mississippi oh. River, and it's right. got multiple dams on it that generate thousands and thousands of megawatts all the time. Whenever it rains, we what get a more. What do yes. you pay for a megawatt? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't tell I, you. I know this is going to hurt me. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you uh. what. What I pay as a residential customer, I, I pay uh, about uh, six point eight cents per kilowatt hour. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. I think I think in in here in Hawaii, you guys pay about thirty three, thirty four cents. Depends on where like you that. are. Yeah. But six cents. Okay. Same same for us. It's, it depends on where you are. It varies from place to place. So this is this is really the best source of energy. Use electrical energy for these uh, these cars. Right. Yeah. yeah, and so they're all electrified. They're, they're all the light rail, the light rail line is all, all so electric. So you never get to the question of fossil fuel because, I mean, assuming people use this, uh, you just use electricity in the cars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of our buses, uh, the TriMet buses, all uh, operate on biodiesel. We uh -huh. have the, the mm -hmm. TriMet has long-term yeah. contracts with a with yeah. a with a company that that manufactures biodiesel. So do you have incentives for electric cars over there? Mm -hmm. Uh, not very many. The, uh, uh, the horse is the federal incentive. You purchase an electric car and you get a, a $7,500. It's a tax rebate. Mm -hmm. Some people can use that. Others can't. Uh, you don't really get the money back, but you can deduct it off of your taxes. Um, and uh, the state of Oregon just a couple months ago passed a new transportation package, and part of the deal was uh, some of the new funding will actually fund a subsidy so you get a rebate from the state if you buy an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I guess the question, uh, and I know Sharon's going to ask you this, is, is, is whether you have succeeded in getting people out of fossil fuels and into non-fossil fuel. And to what extent? I was going to say, define success. Have we uh, succeeded in improving it? Absolutely. Uh, we are the second highest a uh, city in the United States for people riding their bike to work instead of driving their car, despite the fact that our winters are pretty rainy, but they still do. And uh, uh, la latest statistics I've read that for people who commute into the Portland center city for, for work, 30% of the people that commute do so by transit, about 5% by bus, about 25% on our light rail system. That shows how well our light rail system, we have over 60 bus lines in the Portland metro mm. area. We have five light rail lines, but those five light rail lines carry five times as many people as the 60 bus routes do. Mm -hmm. You drive? I, most of the time, as I said, I'm the only metro councilor that lives in a 
a corridor yeah. of the city that does not have a light rail. That, that's, why you, that's why you're working <laughs> on this Southwest that. Carter project. It wants to take rail in instead of well, drive. <laughs> I, I sat on the steering committee for the Southwest Corridor as the mayor of Tigard when I was the mayor, and now that I'm on the Metro Council, I co-chair the committee. Right. <laughs> nice work. Sharon, it's time for you as a co-host to summarize all of this huge body oh, of knowledge know. from yesterday, this morning in the legislature, and well, now. Well, I'm pleased that we were able to get Craig and, and to hear that Portland, while different, um, have some similar challenges and, and we've been able to, to hear from Craig about what we could do, planning long term, planning for people, uh, planning so that we have all, all options and people aren't, you know, the pedestrians aren't, aren't taken off the road or, or um, the buses or bikers take, take precedence over, over cars. But, looking at a system that is truly multimodal and multi-people oriented and I think that that takes us a long way forward if we keep our eye on that prize yeah. so thank you Craig yeah. for sharing yeah. with us. My pleasure. Thank you Craig. One other thing that yes. Portland has in common with Honolulu is we also have a volcano within our city limits. <laughs> no that's right. <laughs> <laughs> But it's been dormant for 200 years. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Craig Dirksen. My pleasure. Thank you very Thank much you. for having Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you. Counselor.